Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we are so glad to see you all here this afternoon uh, for this briefing looking at De the deployment of, a, of electric vehicles, the plug-in electric vehicles, and the difference that they can make. I think that we're all seeing talk about plug-in electric vehicles uh, in all sorts of ads and all sorts of articles. Uh, there are any number of communities across the country that are starting to put in charging stations. And I think that every, every place that I've gone, talked to people, there's been a lot of excitement about these vehicles and about the opportunities that they really do offer as we look at transportation uh, for the, as we move into the future and as we think about how we can address a multiple number of, of issues in our society, let alone people finding that electric vehicles are just plain fun. So we are very, very pleased to be able to have this briefing this afternoon and key to uh, holding this briefing has been our partnership with Congresswoman Janice Hahn's office. She has introduced legislation in support of plug-in electric vehicles. Uh, have been very, very interested uh, in helping promote uh, their deployment across the country, feeling that, again, it addresses many, many issues for this country. Uh, and so to make opening remarks, I would like to turn to her communications director, Henry Connolly, who has been with the Congresswoman since she came to Congress. And he also uh, comes out of Yale University, and he uh, handles the Congresswoman's energy and environmental policy issues. Henry? Thank you, Carol. Um, thank you all for joining us on this rather dreary Tuesday, and uh, also uh, many thanks to EESI and John Michael Cross in particular for helping us put together this event and assembling this auspicious panel. Um, as I think we all know at this point, our reliance on oil to drive our, co our economy is increasingly untenable. Aside from the environmental costs, costs to our climate, uh, there are real national security burdens which are starting to arise. Uh, as anyone who has been paying attention to the difficulties in creating comprehensive sanctions against Iran have noticed, uh, our reliance on oil has made these efforts somewhat cumbersome and has allowed nations that may not wish us well to exert considerable influence uh, and considerable leverage over the state of our economy and the livelihoods of Americans. Uh, this is obviously nothing new, but as uh, the situation continues, more and more we're going to have to get serious about doing something about it. The economic damage of rising fuel costs is, of course, something that in a weak economy has been especially apparent. And the additional tragedy is that these costs are most often felt most acutely by those who are least able to afford uh, presently expensive electric vehicles. However, they stand to benefit the most should electric vehicles finally allow them to divorce their family budgets from fluctuating gas prices, which, as we know, in this world of developing nations and limited oil supply is only going to go up, despite whatever fluctuations we may have at present. So the need of the moment is clear. And fortunately, the remedy has never been more viable than it is today. Electric vehicles are no longer the domain of futurists to be discussed, discussed in the context of personal flying airplanes or hovering cars or anything like that. However, more must be done to accelerate deployment. Electric vehicle deployment at present must overcome obstacles to adoption that are both real and imagined. Some of this is the familiar term of range anxiety, which is the anxiety, of course, experienced by electric vehicle drivers who worry whether they will run out of electric battery before they can reach their destination and so do not test the full range of their vehicles. The truth is this is mostly damaging, uh, most acutely damaging for those prospective owners as uh, some of the members of our panel can attest, once you actually have an EV, you become rather uh, familiar with the difficulties of its range, or I'm sorry, not to say difficulties, that uh, 
you'll find that your daily routine often fits conveniently and securely within the actual range of the car. However, this serves to deter many prospective EV buyers from adopting the vehicles. This leads us to somewhat of the chicken or the egg argument of charging infrastructure versus vehicles, which means that at some point, some actor will have to take a bold step to either push a large scale new vehicle purchase or to dramatically expand public charging infrastructure. Add to this that at present, this is a very nascent industry. We face some of the beta versus VHS challenges of charger standards, networks, and signage that serves to fracture the, the market more than would be uh, preferable. Now, we all know that the training wheels have to come off eventually, but for the time being, there's a clear role for government to push us over the hump. One of these items is, of course, the purchasing tax credit, which serves to dramatically reduce the cost of electric vehicles. And there's something to be said for public charging infrastructure that will be developed ahead of market demand. Unfortunately, we have also, at this moment of opportunity, uh, encountered heightened resistance. Uh, at this critical point in the EV narrative, when we have a burgeoning but still nascent industry, uh, we have found some level of politi politicization, as the good Congressman Daryl Issa has uh, taken a pretty good swing at electric vehicles with his hearings about this, the Chevy Volt, implying that somehow if you get into a catas you know, catastrophic accident and then leave the car in your garage for three weeks, it may start a fire, which is something that I believe has been <coughs> rather severely contested and is on its own a uh, rather peculiar way to go about these vehicles. Uh, However, before then, this has been a relatively bipartisan issue. Uh, Judy Bigger, Republican Congressman of Illinois, holds the, as the lead co-sponsor, I'm sorry, the lead sponsor of one of the chief uh, environmental vehicle deployment bills. Uh, and Senator Lamar Alexander holds the um, distinction of being the other member of Congress, save my boss, who drives a Nissan Leaf. At this moment, and especially coming upon the coming tax reform debate, we're caught between managing expectations and maintaining the ambitious scope and momentum of electric vehicles. Reuters article recently overblowing the cost of um, the Volt shows some of the peril that we face in maintaining a message that uh, does not allow our advocacy to present stories of boondoggle. Environmental marketing versus national security pitch. Uh, one of the interesting features is that although these cars are sold often as environmentally responsible vehicles, this can work at cross purposes to persuading House Republicans who are more uh, persuaded by national security concerns. And when their constituents come to identify these cars with environmentalism, they may be reluctant to embrace the very real national security benefits to be posed, to be presented by wide-scale adoption. Clearly, there's some work to be done. We have to take steps to normalize these vehicles in the public thinking. These cars are viable. They are practical. And the more that we can do to make them familiar, the more that we can advance the critical mass of these vehicles in the marketplace and so that neighbors who see other neighbors driving to work, experiencing no trouble with plugging in their vehicle at home, leaping over many of the psychological barriers which, from now, place them in a realm of, you know, undeserved futurism, we can achieve a critical mass of market share that will help spur the adoption of these cars and allow us to realize the many manifold benefits of electric vehicles and electrification. Now we have a, a very distinguished panel, and I'm sure they'll uh, have many thoughts about the steps that we can take to, to do that and the steps that they are taking to advance that. Uh, for the sake of my own office, uh, there are roughly two things that is important that we together work on. Where is possible, we need to encourage uniform communicating about these vehicles so that we are educating the populace about how viable they are, how easy it is to drive, how fun they are to drive, and whether they make sense for your lifestyle. Because 
For the majority of Americans, the answer is yes, they do. Secondly, in particular now, we must maintain the political appetite for these vehicles and protect and refine the incentives that encourage their adoption. Now more than ever, at this inflection point of electric vehicle adoption and deployment, we must be sure to uh, protect the incentives that are keeping us going in the right direction and not allow the debate to be taken by, with all due respect to anyone from this office, the derelicts of the world. Our need is too great, and the benefits are too evident for us to allow this moment to pass. Now, while we must maintain our patience, we must not concede the debate. Uh, I'm very pleased that all of you he are here to um, listen to these esteemed speakers and hopefully learn a little more about electric vehicles and what we can and should do to encourage their adoption. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, thanks, Henry. We're now going to take a look at what's going on with regard to uh, electric vehicles, looking at the uh, what's happened with regard to R&D, what's happened with regard to fleets, and what's happening with regard to um, how the utility industry is looking at this and, and the whole electric drive industry. So we are very fortunate that uh, we have uh, a wonderful panel this afternoon. And uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Patrick Davis. Uh, Patrick is the program manager of the Vehicle Technologies Program at the U.S. Department of Energy. He has uh, been involved in public service for more than 30 years, working virtually the entire time on the development of vehicle alternative fuel and electrochemical technologies. So he will talk about everything that has been coming out of the DOE program. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's a fantastic panel. We look forward to your questions later. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, I, I have a long history of government service, and I just want to mention, I actually started in the Department of Energy 20 years ago, and I came to the Department of Energy then to work on electric vehicles. So this is a particular passion of mine. This was back in the days of the EV1 and the Toyota RAV4. And so uh, here we are taking a, a second, and I hope a uh, much more successful uh, run at it. Today I want to tell you a little bit about our R&D activities at the Department of Energy, some deployment education work. Uh, if you're familiar with the manufacturing uh, projects under the Recovery Act, we'll tell you a little bit about where they are. And finally, a little bit about the EV Everywhere <coughs> initiative. So R&D, look, our program is, uh, uh, last year's budget was about $330 million. Over half of that is devoted to electric drive R&D. So I could literally stand up here for a couple hours and tell you every little project we have. And we really don't have time for that. So I just wanted to give you a very quick snapshot of what we have underway. Uh, at the department, there's three major organizations doing R&D in this space. ARPA-E is one. My own vehicle technologies program is uh, uh, the second. And the Office of Science would be the third. The kind of technologies we're working on, very um, uh, heavily focused on battery technology. You'll see uh, very shortly the importance of battery technology. In the power electronics area, uh, trying to get the cost, size, and weight of these, of these uh, devices down. Uh, electric motors, trying to solve the rare earth issue with electric motors where uh, rare earth materials and permanent magnets have been a significant concern because there's been a, a great deal of price fluctuation in rare earths as well as just a swing of about a 10x increase in cost over the last few, year, few years. Let me worry about how you put all these pieces together in, in a complete traction system. We worry about the thermal management of these systems. Uh, you know, we're talking about devices that are powerful, very powerful, over 100 kilowatts. So even a little bit of inefficiency creates heat, and you got to worry about how you get rid of that. And then finally, at the vehicle level, we worry about uh, components that are specific to the vehicle, such as uh, HVAC, uh, heating and air conditioning equipment, uh, and, and wireless charging. Uh, under major goals there, I'll just talk about the battery goal for a second. So our, our battery goal for 2015 is $300 per kilowatt hour, and um, ultimately in 2022 we'd like to get down to about $125 per kilowatt hour. So where are we today? 
This chart shows you that great progress is being made in batteries. I want to say we're quite rigorous of the way we measure battery costs. We use a, a validated, peer-reviewed cost model. These are all high-volume cost figures. They are uh, figures based on usable energy. And you can see that just from a few years ago, cost of batteries has um, uh, fallen quite a bit, uh, more than half. Uh, so we've gone from over $1,000 per kilowatt hour to about $500 per kilowatt hour today. That would be the cost of today's lithium ion technology in high volume production. And we're quite confident that we're on a track to meet our, our goal of $300 per kilowatt hour by the end of 2014. And uh, we know that because, or we feel confident about that because of the technologies that are in the laboratory today uh, that, that give us confidence that we're going to be able to, to get there. I will tell you that after $300 a, uh, per kilowatt hour, uh, it gets progressively more difficult to uh, bring costs down. Uh, we're hopeful that we can get to around $125 per kilowatt hour, but it will be much harder than uh, than what the last, the, the great improvements over the last five years have been. So we're focusing on uh, improved cathode technology, high, higher voltage operation. Uh, we're also focusing on beyond lithium ion technology uh, because it's not certain that you can get to those very low costs with lithium ion. And that's about all I'm going to say about R&D. So now we're going to move on to some other topics. Um, under the Recovery Act, we have what we call the world's largest documented electric drive vehicle demonstration. Uh, we are demonstrating 13,000 vehicles on the road in over 20,000 charging locations. And this is really about the data collection on those vehicles. 130 test miles and about 5,000 charging events are being documented every day. So that's not per week or year. Every day, 130,000 miles are being driven on this fleet. And this data is uh, being made available in, in a summary format at the website shown, avt.inel.gov. Every charging event, we know where it happens, when it happens, how much power was drawn, how much energy was drawn. Every time somebody turns on the key to one of these vehicles, we know where they, you know, how far they traveled, how much energy they used. Uh, we basically know everything about how the vehicles are being uh, used and the charging. And you take that data and you learn a lot about how folks are using these vehicles. How many, drive, how many miles are they driving a day? Where are they charging primarily? Where are they charging? If they're doing it in public uh, locations, where are they choosing to do so? And we think this data is, vi is vital in the future rollout and continued rollout and commercialization of uh, electric vehicles. Talk just a little bit about training and deployment. Once again, under the Recovery Act, we had uh, 10 Recovery Act projects that are uh, focused on education. And this was education of everyone from uh, auto technicians, like repair people, to first responders, to uh, uh, students like undergraduates and graduate students. Uh, those projects, some of them are already starting to uh, come to a close. We have our GATE program, Graduate Automotive Technology Education Program, which is focused on um, what it says, graduate education at seven centers of excellence. We have a, almost a 25 year history of running student competitions. Our latest competition is the EcoCar 2 competition, a three year uh, student competition where we are working with 15 major universities across North America with our co-headline sponsor, General Motors. And in this competition series, we have helped train uh, about 16,000 students who have moved through that over the uh, last 24 years. Uh, and finally, we have uh, sponsored 16 community readiness projects. Most of these projects are also uh, nearing completion where at the community level we help with very small amounts of uh, seed funding, help communities decide how they were going to prepare for electric drive vehicles, help them plan for where charging might go, help them put in place policies that might help encourage the uh, adoption of these technologies. Policies like addressing concerns with um, uh, permit time. If you want to install a charger, how long is it going to take you to, to get a, a building permit or the permit to allow you to do that? We think it should be under 24 hours. Uh, so projects like that that are uh, helping communities get ready for uh, these vehicles. 
talk a little bit more about our Recovery Act manufacturing. Uh, if you're familiar with this part of Recovery Act, it was almost uh, $2 billion in uh, funding that went to establish the manufacturing facilities required to uh, build electric drive vehicles. First slide here focuses on uh, battery technology. I just uh, I'm sort of showcasing the Johnson Controls facility in Holland, Michigan, 175,000 square foot facility. But this also includes facilities at SAF, XI, GM, A123, Interdell, East Penn, Dow Cocom, and LG Chem. Uh, we focused not only on the, uh, on the battery and cell production, but also on the, the entire supply chain of this technology. So uh, you see here, chemical foot, also now known as Rockwood Lithium. So this is part of the supply chain that would uh, uh, help produce uh, these battery technologies. Now Rockwood, uh, th this project helped support expansion of their lithium production facilities in Nevada and North Carolina. They're a major domestic supplier of, of lithium. But other projects in the supply chain included uh, separator manufacturers, cathode manufacturers, even the folks who build cans that cells go into. So uh, these awards supported CellGuard, Honeywell, BASF, Energy2, Novalite, Future Fuel, Pyrotech, h and Waterbury, and Tota America. And then I'll finish on the Recovery Act projects uh, by focusing on Magnet E. So it wasn't just about batteries, it's also about the other components that need to be manufactured, electric motors, power electronics, uh, even components such as capacitors that are required by these uh, devices. So the Magnet E-Car e -car project is in Grand Blanc, Michigan, 50,000 square foot facility, suppliers to the uh, Ford Focus EV. Other projects supported were General Motors, Delphi, Alston Transmission, Ford, Remy, and UQM. <laughs> Uh, producing everything from power electronics to uh, transmissions for electric drive. EV Everywhere. We're really excited about EV Everywhere at the uh, department. The, uh, this grand challenge was the second grand challenge uh, designated and announced by uh, the department back in March of this year when the president announced it. Uh, the focus of the, the first grand challenge, by the way, was the Sunshine and Sunshot Initiative, focused on cost reduction of solar technologies. The EV Everywhere Grand Challenge uh, it has the goal of enabling U.S. companies to produce electric vehicles that will, will be as affordable and convenient for the average American family as today's gas-powered vehicles, and to do so within the next 10 years. So most of you probably know that electric drive um, one of the one of the issues to market introduction is cost. How do get how do how do we get cost down? How do we make these vehicles competitive with the vehicles <coughs> that sold today? So for this initiative, we're focusing on a, a benchmark mid-size sedan. We're looking at payback within uh, five years, meaning the savings that you'll achieve from fuel. Uh, your, your, uh, essentially the, your reductions in your fuel costs will pay for the vehicle within five years. Uh, the EV fra framing document is available on our website, easy to find by just doing an internet search on EV everywhere. And uh, we've held five stakeholder workshops this last summer starting in June on uh, everything from the overall initiative to individual technologies. And the EV framing document is uh, open for public comment through the end of October, and we'd certainly invite anyone to uh, take advantage of that. We'll finalize this initiative later this fall and uh, for a final rollout uh, in the winter time. Let me just uh, end with two thoughts. One, a lot of times when you talk about electric drive vehicles, people are thinking of one or two vehicles they've heard of. Most of these vehicles are available today. All of these vehicles are available in the next 12 months. So we're not talking about just one vehicle or two vehicles. We're talking about a lot of vehicles being available. This is not a, a fluke. It's not something that uh, one company is just getting behind. Uh, this, this is something that has some momentum. We need to make sure it, that momentum continues. 
And then I'll just finish as, you know, as Henry commented on as an opening remark. To us, this is about energy security. Uh, we're highly dependent on petroleum. We use two-thirds of our petroleum in the transportation sector. It's about economic security. We're spending over a billion dollars a day just on the imported petroleum we consume. And it's about environmental stewardship. So we think electric drive is an important tool in to help the nation address these key issues. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks very much, Pat. And I must say, it's always really encouraging to hear what else has been happening in terms of driving down the cost of batteries and the kinds of progress that is being made there since that is so often talked about as, as, um, as a key issue. And also, I think it's so exciting to see how so many automakers are really incorporating uh, electric drive and, and EVs into their vehicle lineups. Uh, just wanted to mention there is a seat here and there's a seat up here if somebody wants to take it. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Genevieve Cullen. And Genevieve has uh, been with the uh, electric Drive Transportation Association, EDTA, since 2005. Uh, she is Vice President of EDTA. Prior to uh, going to EDTA, she has done stints in the uh, executive branch and also uh, working on the Hill on the Senate side. So we're delighted that Genevieve is here with us today. Good afternoon. Um, as Carol said, uh, I'm Genevieve Cullen and I'm with EDTA and it, it probably is uh, worth mentioning, uh, uh, taking a moment and explaining who EDTA is. Um, we are a cross-industry trade association. We represent the entire value chain of, of companies involved in electric drive. So that is uh, companies who do lithium and rare earth materials to utilities such as Southern California Edison, uh, OEMs, uh, all the major automobile manufacturers, as well as um, GLEEP purchasers such as UPS, um, and uh, infrastructure providers, and um, electrical integration companies. So we, we cover pretty much the gamut of electric drive. And, um, and our mission is is the electrification of transportation. And that means it's hybrids, it's, it's battery electric vehicles, it's plug-in hybrids, and it's fuel cell vehicles. And you know, for those of you who don't know that, that's what a fuel cell makes is electricity. That's a, a pure battery, a, a pure electric vehicle too. Um, and so where we're standing today, I wanted to put that in context, what we're talking about uh, in plug-in transportation in context of electrifying transportation. And that's where we're moving toward for all the reasons that have been so ably explained. Um, the, you know, the security hazard, the economic hazard, and the environmental hazard, for those in the room who still believe in environmental hazards, yes, there are, there are those associated with combusting oil. So. Um, I just um, wanted to just take a moment and, and put that in context and just, and as, as Patrick said, there is, uh, within plug-in transportation, it's important to realize that there are battery electric vehicles operated solely by batteries and plug-in hybrids. They have different ranges, different uh, price points, different sizes, capacity. There isn't just one vehicle or one range when people say, oh, an electric vehicle doesn't meet my needs. There isn't just one electric vehicle. There's a lot, and we'll, we'll talk about that, but I just want to give you some context as we move into this. Okay, is this forward? Okay, so um, just sort of a snapshot of the market. Um, the GM Bolt and the Nissan Leaf were the first plug-in vehicles to market in, that was the very end of 2010 in limited market rollout. So, you know, all of the press you're hearing about uh, the relative success uh, of this market is based on less than two years in the market and not even full market rollout at that. Um, in the next, um, by the end of this year, there'll be more than 20 plug-in models available. And uh, 
by the end of uh, 2015, there'll be more than, there's another two dozen have been announced uh, coming to the market. The, uh, the national and regional market for infrastructure is growing rapidly. Um, the industry analysts have pegged that as being worth somewhere to five to ten billion dollars by 2015. So, let's get a sense of the numbers. Oh, oh did my print that so small? Um, so, the, the sales numbers on plugins for August was uh, just over was just under 5,000. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot in a, in a big light duty vehicle market, but the fact is um, that's, a 50, that's more than a 56% increase over, um, over the prior month. That's over a 183% increase over the prior year. Um, and so to date this year, somewhere, actually the, the September numbers are out today. I haven't seen them yet though. Uh, but uh, using the August numbers, we're looking at um, just under 26,000 vehicles, and that's 170% give or take over this time last year. So um, the battery, uh, the battery electric and plug-in hybrid market is growing, and it's actually it's a good rollout of a new technology that is not at the moment inexpensive. Um, and it, it involves, a, in some cases, a new fueling paradigm. So I think, uh, uh, we think this is a pretty strong rollout. Um, just uh, to reinforce what Pat said, these are some of the, uh, the vehicles that are available now. Again, they are uh, different configurations, different price points, different ranges. And if you look at the difference, um, you know, between a, a, a Tesla Model S, which has a more than 300 miles on a, and it's a pure battery electric vehicle. Um, the the plug-in Prius uh, is is a is a hybrid that has about 13 miles on its battery, but over 500 miles on its combined range. I also just want to give you some sense of, again, in context, the, um, this is what the and this is what the hybrid market looks like because this. Um, this is all part of a trend toward electrification. You can't get to where we want to get by regulatory demand or by national security demand. You can't get there without electrification. So just wanted to give you a sense of what's coming, uh, here's what's filmed out, and, and what's coming next. So these, um, all the, these vehicles um, on this page have been uh, announced by manufacturers uh, between now and the 2015 model year. And so you can see that this is all the major automakers um, have made a commitment to electrification and in, uh, in all different forms, actually. Uh, so the, the question I think that we're all trying to answer, right, is uh, so we think it's, this is a great thing and it has great promise. How do we speed achievement of commercial scale? That's that's the question. Um, we're all standing sort of in the, at the in this valley of death of where people have made uh, substantial investments in this technology, but before you can get to commercial scale and bring down costs and and sell in more volume, you know, we have to get this foothold in the market. So, uh, you know, as an industry. Um, uh, my members are investing significantly in, um, in the technology and in building markets, and we are working a lot with uh, the Department of Energy, who's done great work. Thank you, Beth. Um, thank you. Um, and it, and, um, and has been there's, there's bipartisan support on this. They, you know, in this political season, a lot of, um, there's a lot of noise around these things, but the fact is, uh, since I've been working on this, there has been uh, ongoing and solid bipartisan support for, you know, building uh, American industry for being globally competitive in the energy market and for reducing our dependence on foreign oil. So what it, as the policy levers that we're talking about should be aimed at, we need to speed technology advances. So that's increasing battery range and, uh, and reducing costs of, the, of components. Um, it's about addressing market hurdles, and that's essentially that's bringing down market costs and getting uh, sufficient infrastructure installed. And finally, um, it's about 
um, updating our regulatory structures. And I'll just take a, a minute or two and, and run you through those. Um, so what I mean by uh, speeding, so in speeding technology breakthroughs, what we're, we're talking about is, is continuing the public and private R&D that's been going on. And, um, you know, uh, DOE, as, as Patrick pointed out, has had great success in bringing down those battery costs. Um, and it, that's a really rapid decline in costs. Um, and the, their uh, launching of, the, of an EV Everywhere initiative that all of my members are participating in that will lay down the metrics for, uh, for technology and, and deployment that's going to help us you know, make a roadmap to uh, commercial scale deployment is going to be really important going forward. As far as um, addressing market hurdles, just um, specifically, there are, um, there are tax incentives in place that help bring down the initial cost of this technology. So the uh, plug-in electric drive vehicle credit is an important one to consumers. It's be from between $2,500 up to $7,500 for the purchase of a vehicle, and it's, a, it's an important market mechanism. But in addition to that, there's a... Um, there is an investment tax credit for alternative fuel infrastructure. We just call it the charging credit, but it applies to all alternative fuels. Unfortunately, that credit expired at the end of 2011, and we are working hard with our members of Congress and their staff. Um, <laughs> just to see that. <laughs> no question. Um, to see that that gets extended. Um, and I, I think it's also important uh, that in looking at incentives that is to look beyond light duty because uh, electrification actually is, is not just cars. It's also medium and heavy duty trucks and they have a great role to play not only in uh, reducing gas consumption or diesel more specifically and emissions but uh, in fact in helping industry move, get, achieve economies of scale and components. Um, also, another part about moving markets is, is supporting deployment programs. Uh, Clean Cities has been in place um, for a long time. They do great work. It's regional, voluntary efforts to put alternative fuel vehicles and infrastructure in place. It's a small program. It would be cool if it were really a lot bigger. So, there's something. <laughs> 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 And I, and I think there's also something, you know, that we work um, with, with um, state, local, and federal government, and a lot of this is going to depend on information sharing. There's a lot of really successful efforts going on regionally, what's happening in California and Oregon, uh, actually in Michigan, there's, um, in Austin, there are uh, people on local governments and communities are putting vehicles and infrastructure in place, and the lessons they are learning they can share with other communities that what is the right amount of time? How do you speed up that permitting process for installing a charger? Um, everybody shouldn't have to learn it from, for themselves from scratch. Um, and finally, um, uh, what we need to do is we make, have to make sure that our old regulatory systems actually uh, recognize the value of this new technology. Um, this is at the intersection of, of the stationary power and, um, and the transportation sector and, and how to value those uh, emissions reductions, those efficiency benefits um, in, in things, you know, in the obvious one is the, the fuel economy rules, but they're also in our regulations governing um, utility policies and how they recognize, how they encourage time of use pricing. Um, and also, and this is to you again, Pat. Um, you know, the, the federal regulations that govern state and local fleets and how you comply with those efficiency requirements, um, they need some updating to recognize what, the, what new technologies are available to, to fleet buyers. And I know that you all have been working on it, but um, can you move that um, and That's it for me. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Genevieve. And obviously, utilities are an important piece of this whole picture as well. 
and to talk a little bit more about that and the role of utilities and how they view uh, this whole move with regard to increased transportation electrification is, is Edward Kerr, who is the director of Southern California Edison's Plug-in Electric Vehicle Readiness Program. And Ed has worked around the auto industry for around 30 years, but he's, uh, and he's also been involved with the utility industry for a lot of years. So it is indeed a perfect marriage. Ed. Thank you. Well, I'd like to start by telling everybody how disappointed I am with this panel. <laughs> because not one of you got the secret sign that says, wrap up, you're going over time. <laughs> so I'm about to break all the rules. I'm going to completely fix it because I think we need to, for the last two, change this entire paradigm. But um, actually, what I would like to do is start off uh, and talk a little bit about the accomplishments today. Because I think this, this part, this question about plugging into our transportation future is really kind of misunderstood a little bit. You know, at the end of the day, uh, what we have is we have, I think, significant accomplishments today. We've got uh, administration support. The policies of this administration have really helped this industry, have helped this country begin to plug into our transportation future. Um, we've got political engagement, both at the national level and at the local market level. In California, uh, we have a very engaged legislature uh, that supports uh, electrification of transportation, that supports fuel diversity. And it's also interesting enough, you know, this coming from an electric utility guy, um, you know, we like all electrification of transportation, obviously, but fundamentally we need other sustainable transportation solutions as well. We're going to need biofuel. We're going to need natural gas. It's going to have roles to play in our transportation future. It's not one size fits all, and it's not just one solution. And I think that speaks a little bit to also what Genevieve was saying. Um, we've got tremendously effective trade associations. Uh, Genevieve represents the Electric Drive Transportation Association. There's the Edison Electric Institute, which is uh, the voice of the investor-owned utilities here in the United States. There are organizations at the local market, like for instance in California, there's the California Electric Transportation Coalition, and that is utilities and, and automakers. Uh, so, so trade associa associations are really important. I think what's also important is consistent commitment. Uh, in the case of uh, Edison, you know, we've been supporting transportation electrification for well over 20 years now. And our, our chairman, Ted Craver, is the recent past chair of Electric Drive Transportation Association, and he is also co-chairs uh, Edison Electric Institute's CEO Transportation Task Force. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to build these coalitions, because it's not about one company and one solution. It's got to be something that is scalable for the nation. And that requires all of us to be fully engaged. And then speaking of engagement, local cities are really important in this whole equation. And there's, there's across the country, you're seeing this uh, kind of grassroots effort to uh, support transportation electrification. Uh, and cities are really important to that. So, so far we've got over 50,000 plug-in vehicles, modern plug-in electric vehicles on the road today. Over 50,000. <clears> and uh, Genevieve said she didn't have the latest sales. Well, I just went straight on the internet and I got the latest sales. So General Motors hit another sales record. So it was about 2,851 units, I think. Uh, uh, the Nissan Leaf sold almost 1,000 units. So they're up big time. Carlos Ghosn was talking about this being the first month of the beginning of the turnaround for uh, leaf sales. Uh, and I believe Toyota sold about uh, also about a thousand um, plug-in Priuses. So to put one of those sales numbers in perspective, the Volt, 2,851 units. Basically, uh, as of last month, they had outsold about 50% of all the car lines that, you, that the United States sales today. 
about 50%. It was almost 100 car loans year to date. So I think, you know, when somebody says, nah, these things just aren't selling, nobody's buying them. That's not true. In fact, if you look at where we are in the plug-in vehicle market in terms of sales, it's about 2x where we were at the same point in market development for hybrids a decade ago. About 2x. So I think that bodes pretty well for the future of plug-ins in the United States. So I think that be careful that we don't get caught up in the rhetoric of what's driving somebody's position because at the end of the day I think the sales numbers are speaking for themselves. I think who else is speaking for themselves is the customers. We shouldn't forget this part. The customer voice is very loud and very compelling. One of the things about plug-in electric vehicles, and okay, I'm, I'm a bit strange. I'm sure most of you are completely surprised to hear me say that. But uh, I've been driving electric vehicles for half my career. So I have about 119,000 EV miles on an old Toyota RAV4 EV from the 1990s. And then I have about 7,500 miles on a Chevy Bolt. And those 7,500 miles, of those 7,500 miles, about 5,800 of them are all electric. It's an electric car. But it also has this range extender. So I don't have any concerns about range anxiety. Okay, which was Henry was talking about. So we've got to be careful about not categorizing electric vehicles and defining them just one way. And that, that was what Genevieve was trying to say. They come in a variety of different flavors to meet the needs of a diverse audience of customers. But these customers are so emotionally invested in this technology. There is this incredible visceral connection that you get when you drive an electric car. They love the way it sounds, they love the way it feels, they love the acceleration, the accelerate. Electric cars only have two speeds, go and stop. Okay, no gears. They're little rocket ships. They're not golf carts. So there's this incredible feeling that customers get. And one of the things that they love is the way people look at them and the reaction that they get driving down the road, on the freeway, at the local mall. And that reaction is that kind of reaction. Yeah, good for you. I particularly love it driving in the carpool lane in California because you get these great big SUVs driving, you know, in the other lanes. And they're kind of doing this. And you know what? Because they're going to enjoy electrification at some point. You're going to start to see SUVs and trucks with electric propulsion systems in them. You already have it today with gas hybridization. And you will have plug-in technology going in SUVs and trucks. In fact, Mitsubishi will be launching the Outlander in another year or so here in the United States. And that will be a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. So, an amazing emotional connection that customers have with the technology. And I often get asked, yeah, but Ed, okay, so that's fine. That's the early adopters. Those guys are a bit weird. We've got to get to the mass market. Well, the God's honest truth is we have about 260 million cars on the road today here in the United States. We're selling about 14 million cars a year. And plug-ins are 0.00000001% of it. I think we're not through the early adopters yet. All right, in fact, the early adopters and the fast followers, next five years. So this emotional connection, it's going to be with us for a while. And I would argue, actually, it's going to be with us permanently. Because a mass market customer buying a plug-in vehicle today will still have that same emotional connection. It's not a rational, logical purchase when we come to buy automobiles in the United States. It's the second most emotional purchase we make next to our houses. And many of us actually can't afford to buy houses today. So in many cases, it's going to be the first emotional purchase that we make in our lives. Um, so, so about 
Now, 75 to 80 percent of the market is plug-in hybrids. Um, about 50 percent of the market is connecting at level one, so that's like they drive the car home from the lot and they literally plug it in just like any other appliance in the house at 110 volts. And then about 50% of the market is saying, you know what, I want a bit faster charging. So they, they're putting in some infrastructure in their home to support the fueling of the vehicle. Um, but the vast majority are fueling at night, and utilities love that, all right, because that's when we've got a lot of excess capacity. The DOE did a study some years ago to kind of look at the US grid. The US grid, which is 100% US, it's 100% domestic. We don't import any feedstocks to make electricity in the United States. We make it all within our borders, for the most part, other than importing a little bit of energy from, from Canada and from Mexico. So it's domestic. So the fuel that's going into our transportation future, we control. And this very much goes to, to Pat's point about energy security. We control it. We're not beholden on anyone to fuel the wheels of the future. And what's interesting, I think, about the grid is there's this excess, tremendous excess capacity. It's a national energy security asset. A lot of excess capacity at night. Enough to basically fuel 75% of all of the light duty cars and trucks on the road today. So, well north of 100 million vehicles could plug into the grid tomorrow. <laughs> I got the sign. <laughs> could plug into the grid tomorrow, off peak, and we wouldn't have to build one new power plant. Off peak is the operative word there. But it's natural for this load to connect off peak because that's when cars come home at night. And they spend 10 hours at home. And while we're asleep, your car is fueling. And then you wake up in the morning and you've got a full tank and away you go. And the final point, I think, back to this kind of emotion, this emotional connection. You know, today, when we go to a gas station, we go to a gas station once a week and we have no control. All right? We have to pay the prevailing price and we can see how volatile it is. And we as consumers, I think, are bounded by two emotions, two powerful, incredibly powerful emotions. One is anger, and the other is fear. We're angry because so much is out of our control today in our lives. So much is out of our control. And we're scared because we also don't have control. When you plug into the grid, it is all about control. I can choose to fuel during the day, I can choose to fuel at night, I can choose to fuel at level one, at level two, I can turn it on, I can turn it off. It all happens when I'm asleep. And that, we find from the research, is incredibly liberating, incredibly powerful. And you feel that connection when you drive past a gas station and not stop at the gas station. So I'll leave you with that thought. Look forward to uh, the questions and some healthy debate. Great. Thanks. And, and aren't we relieved that Ed has no passion about this issue? Uh, and, and I must say, um, on EESI's board of directors, there's a guy by the name of Roger Duncan who is the former head of Austin Energy. And several years ago, Roger got Austin Energy heavily engaged and, and, and worked with organizing a whole lot of other utilities in the country to look at this whole role of electrification uh, of transportation because in Texas they were doing a lot of work in terms of bringing on wind power. And wind in Texas blows at night, which meant that this was a way that they could really then use that wind energy was to think about putting it into electric plug-in vehicles. So the thing is, um, I think that as we've been hearing, you know, looking at vehicles, they come in all kinds of shapes, sizes, purposes. Uh, they're used for all sorts of different functions, which is why we thought that it was also really important to look at the very important role of fleets in the U.S. and 
what could be better than looking at what is happening with Big Brown. And so we uh, have with us Jim Bruce, who is the Vice President for uh, Corporate Public Affairs for UPS. And Jim has been working on energy policy for years and years and years um, when he, he spent many years as counsel uh, on the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Jim? Thank you, Carol. I will not say how far back we go together. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. You should understand that uh, we did not begin It's Big Brown. We were actually red. We were the Red Arrow Bicycle Messenger Company. And we've been in business over 100 years. For the first five years, we were bicycle messengers. It was not until the fifth year that we made the big jump to a Model T truck. And <clears throat> so we gradually evolved into Big Brown. And uh, there's some other accoutrements that go with it uh, to give you a sense of our com company. Hopefully, the name Big Brown alone tells you these characteristics. But it wasn't long before we had electric vehicles. These are plug-in electric, lead-acid batteries. We had a whole fleet of them in New York City. There's pictures of them. We still have one that I occasionally have brought to Washington for events. It still runs. Um, it's simple, very, very reliable, although we did manage to break the drive shaft, bringing it down from a truck that had hauled it up here. Um, but the basic components are simple. I mean, the, the attraction of the electric, plug-in electric vehicle was very clear to us 80 years ago. The problem was the battery. Now, why does UPS care about alternative fuel vehicles. And I really can't see this very well, but we use about a billion gallons of petroleum a year, UPS does. Roughly 400 million gallons of diesel fuel. Um, we have something north of 90,000, almost 100,000 trucks. We have the 10th largest airline in the world. We use a lot of petroleum. And we're in 220 countries which means we have to answer to governments in many, many places. The big problem for us with petroleum is not so much buying the fuel, it's the volatility in prices. It can cost us hundreds of millions of dollars from one year to the next extra, and we have no way to predict what that will be. In fact, that's the only thing that I'm aware of in our rates where we have to allow for the possibility of a fuel adjustment charge. Now, our alternative fuel fleet which is, since I really can't read what that says, is about 20, almost 2,600 vehicles. And you'll see we test, we have all sorts of things. The most recent is 100 plug-in electric vehicles. These are delivery vans we bought for California. But we have electric uh, hybrid as well, uh, about 400 diesel electric hybrid trucks. These are all trucks. The brown truck that stops in my office up here on Pennsylvania Avenue is a diesel electric hybrid. Works great, drivers love it. So we're, we're trying everything and, and that's really the essence of our policy is that we want to understand all of these technologies and we want to try them in real service. Now this is a chart I made up. Don't pay too much attention to the numbers, but all it's really trying to say is this. We have lots of different missions for our trucks. We have 17,000 heavy over-the-road tractor trailers, some of them pulling double, even triple trailers. <clears throat> that, that is an enormous load. The only thing that will power that vehicle is either diesel fuel or liquid natural gas. And we've been running liquid natural gas heavy tractor trailers for over a decade. Um, we have about 93 deployed. We're about to bring on another 100, and these are extraordinarily attractive. They use 5% diesel, 95% natural gas. But then if you want to move into electric hybrids, you can 
It's less range, less weight, but they're very attractive. You'd never use a liquid natural gas engine for a small truck. It makes no sense. So we have these missions like our little brown trucks might go 60 miles range a day, whereas the heavy tractor trailer will go 500 to 600 miles a day. We have a variety of technologies that we're attempting, and as you get to shorter range and shorter uh, weights, then you have all sorts of options. And electric, plug-in electric is definitely one of those options. Now, if you were to say, what is the UPS philosophy? We really don't have a dog in the fight. We are fuel neutral. We do what works. And I may have to read this. I can't see it at all from there. Let's see. But you like electric drive the bus? Well, no. I mean, the, the, fact, the fact is... We are on the board of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. We're also on the board of the Natural Gas Vehicle Association. And why are we on the EDTA? Because we see that as the future. And we're buying those vehicles now, they make sense. Um, if you look at, as I said, on the heavy trucks, you're talking diesel fuel or LNG. The problem with all of the alternative fuel vehicles is having enough is using them for enough distance to make up the initial cost of the vehicle. And we see these technologies are making tremendous strides and we see the cost of the vehicles coming down. What's key has been the federal and state incentives so that we can get some assistance up front. And that's still the case today. Um, we do believe that electric drive Many of our engineers, many engineers generally believe the electric drive is where it all goes eventually. Maybe not for the heavy over-the-road tractor, but for delivery vans and so on. We're very interested in fuel cell trucks. I mean, it's a battery you pour electricity into is the form of a fuel. I built one at, for a high school fair from scratch. I will not tell you how long ago that was. But I do remember that it was fortunate the judges came around at night because transistor radios get best reception at night. <laughs> but, you know, I, I always was amazed by the technology of the fuel cell because it has inherently much higher efficiency than any internal combustion engine. My, my particular device did not, but the theoretical ones do. And so, you know, we, we see electric drive, whether it's by battery or whether it's by fuel, it can be hydrogen, it could be methanol. All of, that, all of those are options. And we think we need to be a part of all of those options and understand them. Now this is uh, this all of the above strategy, which is something that I think President Obama evolved to. But he, he is at our Las Vegas facility and that UPS truck in the background, there are two of them. One is a, a uh, hybrid electric delivery van, the other is an LNG heavy tractor. <clears throat> and he makes the point that it's a matter of all, all out, all in, all of the above strategy. And that's essentially our strategy. And electric drive, plug-in electric, electric hybrid, that's all part of the mix that we see for the future. Now, if there is a certain natural progression of technologies. Our trucks have run on petroleum, and we started building hybrid electric, diesel hybrid electric, even hydraulic hybrid, and I won't go into what that is, but the fact is this marrying of internal combustion engines and, and batteries makes a lot of sense for us. And as I say, we have over about 400 of them in service. But we're also moving into the plug-in electric vehicles, and the fuel cell is of great interest to us in the future because of the efficiency that you can ultimately get. And of course, the, the emissions output is, depending on the fuel, maybe as simple as water, water vapor. So uh, the other thing to note is that fleets, because they're essentially fuel, not all fleets are, but I, ours are. I mean, I can show you a map. I pulled it because of time of our hubs across the country. Our, all of our trucks come back at night to the same place. So they're ideal for alternative fuel 
uh, either uh, charging or refueling or whatever. And <clears throat> so that's, that is probably the most effective place to start if you want to do alternative fuel deployment. Now the other thing is that because we're in all of these other countries, we're facing environmental requirements. We're going to face urban congestion limitations. Um, we have to be ready to move the truck from point A to B. We don't particularly care what it is as long as it's very cheap to buy the truck, the fuel is cheap, and it has no emissions. If we have that, we're, we're happy. Uh, and so we're indifferent. But the, the, the array of technologies that we're interested in drive us to electric drive. Um, there's just no question about that. This is one of the hundred electric, plug-in electric vans that we bought for California before we painted it brown. This is a heavy liquid natural gas power tractor trailer pulling two trailers. If you looked at it very carefully, you wouldn't see much in the way of difference, and that's the point. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. Uh, let's open it up for your questions uh, at this time. And we'll start over here. Go ahead. One of the things that uh, puzzles me is this innovation take off when there's a market and yet I'm thinking of standards like the idea of DC taking that industry off. Um, you've all talked about how there's a lot of choices and a lot of alternatives, and that's a good thing, but a standard platform is a good thing too. So I'm uh, interested in your thoughts about that. Sure. Well, I, I would say um, because I represent a, a diverse set of makers, um, and they actually have all different uh, market paths on electrification. And I think while a standard is um, is is one way forward. I, this is this is a new frontier, and people are looking at their own platforms. And Toyota is has vowed to build hybridization into every one of their models, and adding um, a grid connected facility or adding fuel cells to that is, is their path forward. Um, Nissan's path forward is pure battery electric, uh, and and everything in between. Uh, and I think in this industry that helps because. There are so many different drivers and duty cycles. Um, and duty cycles, not even just in commercial applications, but between everybody in this room uses their car differently and they need to, to, to move four kids, two teens, you know, one set of golf clubs with a 40 mile commute. Everybody has a sort of different configuration and meeting those needs is, is what it's going to take for us to succeed. Sure. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I would just add, look, if, if um, all these models that, that both Genevieve and I showed, uh, if they were all going to build their own design electric motors and their own battery cells and their own power electronics, um, yeah, you probably would have a little bit of a point. But the, the reality is, you know, there's a limited number of battery manufacturers out there that are going to be supplying most of these models that are what helps get the volume up and, and helps supply an industry which is used to making a lot of models. As Ed pointed out, you know, the Volt sell, out selling about uh, half the market right now because uh, half the market is comfortable with selling uh, the uh, sales volumes that are, are, are below that amount. So uh, this is an industry that really can um, tolerate a lot of different kind of markets and, and niches, if you will. So, so I, I think the, the other thing I would say is that the, the, the legacy technology today doesn't come in one platform, right? You have four cylinders, six cylinders, V8s, V12s, you know, turbocharging, uh, cylinder deactivation, and that's 
to meet the needs of the marketplace, which are very diverse. So the beauty of electrification is multiple different flavors. You can have the pure battery electric car, you can have the gas hybrid electric car, like the Toyota Prius, you know, the, the tens of thousands, the hundreds of thousands of gas hybrids that are on the road today. Millions, actually, what am I talking about? Millions. Um, you can have the plug-in hybrid fuel cell, you can have plug-in hybrids, you can have fuel cells. So multiple flexibility with electrification, okay, it comes in a variety of different flavors. You can then also pair it with other um, sustainable alternative fuels like biodiesel uh, or uh, uh, ethanol, um, natural gas. So when you have a hybrid powertrain, you can use an alternative fuel as well as the electricity on board of the vehicle from the grid. So, so I think that lots of flexibility. You don't need one standard. Kemp, did you want to add? We don't build any of our own trucks. They're all custom made. Um, the little brown truck you see on the street is aluminum body, all custom made. And we have various suppliers and um, we tend to buy. We do not retrofit, or rarely retrofit. We build it for 20 years and then we crush it. You'll never find a used UPS truck on the street. So um, we get the benefit of platforms of various manufacturers to pick from. So, I mean, that works for us, to have the options of various manufacturers of components, of chassis, and uh, it works well. Can I follow up with a quick one? Um, okay, quickly, does and then we'll that, go back here. Does that influence the infrastructure building? Are they all compatible? across the infrastructure build-up? Well, from an electrification perspective, um, the, the, uh, when it plugs into the grid, there is standards, right? So you have J1772, which is a plug connector standard, and most of the auto industry is following that standard because we're trying to avoid the whole beta VHS exactly. situation. Right. When you start to look at multiple uh, alternative fuels like natural gas, like biodiesel, then you you do have a situation of multiple uh, infrastructure <coughs> to support that. But but understand, I mean we're we're consuming somewhere in the neighborhood I think uh, 20 million was it 20 million uh, barrels of oil a day. We've got 170,000 gasoline stations. So if we are to convert the entire fleet over to alternative fuels. This was the point I was trying to make. You're going to need it all. You're going to need natural gas. You're going to need sustainable biodiesel. And you're going to need electrification. The good news about electrification, recognizing where I come from, the good news about electrification is the infrastructure of all of the alternative fuels, ethanol, methanol, biodiesel, natural gas, hydrogen, electricity, the electricity is ubiquitous. I mean, the gas station is as close as your nearest plug. Um, so from our perspective, there's really not an infrastructure challenge. It's there. We're just focusing on literally the last 50 feet of the energy system. Other alternative fuels, it's a little bit more challenging. But, but I will tell you, in every single case of a, of a sustainable alternative fuel or a new propulsion system, there are pros and cons. There's not one silver bullet in all of this, okay? There's all of it's got challenges. Because we've been doing it a certain way for a hundred mumble years, it's going to take, you know, some effort to, to, for us to do this. And, and, but we're definitely on the path. Okay, there's a question or comment. Okay, back here. Mm -hmm. uh, did you give any estimate on the amount of greenhouse gas emissions reductions you have achieved through conversion, whether it be to natural gas or uh, plug -in? We, um, we compute, if you ask UPS, can we enter into a contract with you, say for example, uh, Toto Toilets, you ever heard of Toto high-end toilets? We have a contract with them and we, we move their domestic product, we product in the United States, and we compute how much carbon we emit in moving all their products and we charge them 
we can tell them exactly how much it is, and then we can neutralize it. We'll buy carbon neutral credits. We can do that if you you want to just ship one package and you want to pay, say it's a crown package, a nickel, we'll offset. We'll buy highly credible carbon credits and retire it. Um, you ask me, well, you know how much it is. It's not a, hard, a, a huge amount. I mean, with a fleet of like 2,500, when we've got 90-some thousand trucks, it's pretty clear it's not a great deal at the moment. But it's growing. I mean, I, as I recall, you know, we're going up at something like 100% a year. The numbers are all turned to, you know, I'd have to go back and check the numbers. But um, we, our expansion is, is rather dramatic in terms of numbers of vehicles. In terms of our total carbon emissions, probably not. I mean, we look at it all in terms of, of um, having the greatest, the, the, the lowest carbon intensity that we can. It, as we grow, where our, our carbon emissions actually go up, but the carbon intensity improves so that the planet is better off. So um, I think if you look at our sustainability report, I think we actually have a number. But you know, it's 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 small. I, you know, having said that, I think it's also important to realize that, again, with electrification, it's not just about the car, but it's port electrification, it's truck stop electrification, it's fundamental sustainable goods and people movement. When you start to add up what has already been electrified today, forklifts, um, light duty rail, you know, passenger vehicle, uh, 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 passenger conveyance, when you start to add all that up, the carbon reduction is pretty darn significant when you compare it to petroleum. All right, but there's a lot of headroom still to go. But if we are successful as a nation in uh, decarbonizing transportation, it's going to come from electrification. A big piece of it's going to come from electrification. But I would just add that you know we're in a mold. I mean, we use, we're the biggest user of rails in the United States. We ship thousands of trailers on the rails. Uh, we'll move packages from air to ground because that uses us for fuel. So we look at the entire system in terms of how much carbon we avoid, and that's millions of tons of carbon. So, you know, they, the alternative fuels will grow over time. It will become significant. All of these alternative fuel vehicles have a lower carbon footprint than petroleum or, or diesel. I mean, the, the uh, natural gas is probably about 25% less carbon emission. Great. Okay. Well, that all brought several comments. Okay. We'll go start in the back first and then we'll come to you. Okay. Um, a couple of you mentioned the role of local governments in communities in supporting uh, electric vehicle development. And I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on steps communities can take to facilitate EV deployment as well as um, support mechanisms to to support the communities in this work, particularly for the power grid. Uh, I can start. As I mentioned, we had uh, we had 16 uh, community readiness grants of, uh, funded through our Clean Cities program to help uh, communities uh, look at removing some of these uh, barriers that that exist and are unique to, to communities. So I mentioned the, uh, the permit time. So right now, there's, there's actually 40,000 local jurisdictions that, that can do permits in different ways. Some, some permits can be done uh, by permit by notification, which is essentially a no time to get a permit. Others might take weeks to get. This is not a way to roll out a technology if you're an automaker to have to deal with all these different uh, uh, possible situations that your customers might uh, confront. So that's one thing. Try and get the permit time down. Another thing are other policies that, that can really matter a lot. I think it was Ed that mentioned the HOV lane access. That's really handled mainly at the local level and that uh, can be a real critical market in any part. Uh, parking policies. Um, uh, that can be everything from you know uh, municipal parking regulations to uh, how businesses ha uh, handle it and, and how you might do uh, public uh, charging. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of policy measures like that. In addition to that, uh, there, there's also just ways that uh, local communities are going to help uh, plan out 
where, uh, for instance, where fast charging might be. If you're going to if you're going to do a network of fast charging that they uh, started in Oregon, you really have to plan at that local level. You just can't wait for uh, um, people just to start putting in stations in a random fashion. So there's a, a, a couple local planning issues that are important. Okay, go ahead. Um, Bob Green, I could believe. Um, transportation committee. One of the things we hear quite often about standard platforms is that when you look at the gas vehicles, there's 400 models of gas vehicle, and the number one selling vehicle is only used by 2% of the public. So 98% of the public are not even going to buy that one best vehicle, selling vehicle. And so there's a tendency for everybody to take one electric car and say, that's not for me, and then condemn the whole industry when the other 99% might be perfectly happy with that, that vehicle. And you asked about standards, and of course, uh, every car comes with a standard charge cord. This is standardized on the vehicle end, and this is standardized on the other end. And there's a hundred times more of these than our charging stations. So, uh, you know, the grid is out there, as Ed has pointed out, one of the statistics that he mentioned was that 50% of all vehicle charging today is, is done on the standard cord. But what that's overlooking is that it's because the other 50%, when you go to work, you can't get your employer to let you plug in because there's not an acceptance of the fact that it's 20 cents an hour to do that. For 20 years, I've been trying to get permission to plug into a, a government outlet six feet from where I park. I cannot find anybody in the federal government that can say, yes, you can pay $10 a month and you can plug into that outlet. <laughs> Nobody can do that. I think we need an executive order to just do it. We're not asking for free electricity. We want to pay in the plug-in. So I wonder if that statistic of 50 percent would be higher if people were able to plug in at work. Actually, I think the Senate has have Actually, moved on that, or the, the Congress and Senate, Senate have yeah. passed, uh, have passed legislation enabling the architect of the Capitol right. to allow charging. So, because the, the problem was, your the uh, concept is you're afraid of giving a private a taxpayer benefit to a private citizen, which is why what's, which is the hurdle between government employers doing that. But the architect of the capital is going to, it has laid out plans to establish either a, a subscription system or some pathway forward, right. and that can be the model for, for, the, for the larger federal government. But it's only for L2 charging. They're still ignoring all of those outlets that are already in the garage that the, that senator could have plugged into. We if he need to change it all in one day. We're going to start here and then we'll move on. But everybody else, unless my, my boss plugs in at work and just in the, in the 110. See? Um, and that nobody charges them because it's too cheap to meter. Right. So we are seeing a lot of changes around. Okay, over here. Uh, I drive a uh, 2012 Nissan Leaf. And I charge it in my garage uh, overnight, and I'm the usual paradigm. And then I, I actually drive it to Metro, to me mostly in Metro, but I could drive it to work, and I have driven that occasionally, and uh, plugged in level one at work. And Level one actually makes a lot of sense for charging at work during the daytime while you're, you know, in, in your office mm -hmm. building. And uh, so my question for the utilities is, I, I know that, uh, you know, off-peak charging overnight is, is great for, for the utilities. Uh, but if there's a lot of people doing L1 charging during the day, you know, that's the non optimal time. So are, do, do the utilities have some sort of disincentive that you're doing? No. The, the L1 no. So, so I 100 percent agree with you. I think uh, uh, level one in uh, non-residential applications makes all the sense in the world. I mean, when you think about it, you know, large parking structures or um, uh, you know already have lighting in there that's used at night. Well, the lights aren't on during the day. So the, the capacity is already there. The infrastructure is fundamentally already there. Um, what you're talking a little bit about is uh, this issue of, well, if, I'm, if, if we're encouraging non-residential charging, then aren't we encouraging on-peak charging, and isn't that a problem? So if you look at the market today, so a, a plug-in hybrid electric car like the Volt, uh, the average um, uh, all electric vehicle miles traveled is probably about 35 to 40 miles. It's the battery. Uh, for, the, for the battery electric car, the average 
all electric DMT vehicle miles traveled today in the United States is about 30 miles. So if you pull up, pull up at home at night, you've got a, a brand new battery in the morning, you've got a full battery in the morning, 70% of the market commutes less than 40 miles a day. So you're only using a percentage of the battery every day. So you go to work and you plug in at level one, chances are you're fueling on the, the shoulders, meaning you're not actually fueling in the middle of the day because you're done. And most uh, major uh, corporations have very sophisticated energy management systems. So they have the ability to interrupt the charging during the peak and then bring it back up again after the peak and you're still going to be done by the time you drive home five o'clock at night for the most part. So, so I think that, you know, frankly, uh, it, is, it is not a challenge today. All right? We don't really see it as a, as, a, as a difficult issue today. I think once you get millions of vehicles on the road, two things will happen. One is that the grid will have adapted because the grid over the last hundred years has adapted to what's called low growth. So whether it be plasma TV screens or air conditioning or pool pumps or the Goodyear blimp and painted rocks, it has adapted. Okay? And transportation electrification doesn't happen overnight. It's not a light switch. You don't go from 0% penetration to 100% penetration overnight. So it is happening at a cadence that the grid is adapting to and will adapt to across the country. The second thing that's happening with the grid is the grid is getting smarter because more and more digital technology is being deployed on the grid. And so we will have the ability to send signals to the vehicle. We'll have the ability to communicate with the vehicle. We're developing those standards now so that we have the ability to evolve to what we call smart charging or intelligent charging. Where we can ramp it up, we can ramp it down depending on what's going on in the grid. Somebody talked about wind at night. We'd be able to say, come on, come on cars, get hungry, we'll take more and more of you now because the wind's blowing. <laughs> right? Or we can slow it down. But we have these broad windows of time that we can deal with. In the case of off-peak hours, in our case, 9 o'clock at night till noon the next day, that's our off-peak window. Plenty of time to fuel vehicles. Plenty of time. So, so I think that, frankly, we're going to be able to handle it because of those two reasons. The grid adapts and because of the technology that's being deployed on the grid. I really don't see non-residential charging as being an on-peak challenge. Okay, over here. Question for Jim. Jim, what's your return on investment for your trucks, for some of the <laughs> fuel trucks? You know, you talk about 2,500 trucks that you have. What's your, what's your company's expectation of turning net positive at some point in time? And how does that factor into your decision about what to buy? It depends on uh, whether we're getting uh, government assistance. We're on the cusp of possibly being, well, there, there are certain vehicles where it's very close in certain areas. Like we have 900 propane trucks in Canada. Certain places propane is very, very inexpensive. Um, so it's, you know, it's difficult to, I don't want to give you a year to compute it to what's the, what's the payback? At what point does it become, is it five years or three years or seven years? And we know that, I don't particularly want to disclose it, or 10 years. And uh, that, believe me, that's all measured very carefully. And we wouldn't be doing this if we didn't see the possibility of doing it in quantity. Because we're losing money essentially in all right now. But it's the future. I mean, if you have geometric growth in the numbers of alternative fuel vehicles, then it starts to have a big impact on your petroleum consumption. So I don't know if that's a straight answer or not, but uh, electricity is not there yet. But getting a lot better fast. Well, it's also interesting in terms of thinking about other fleets to how many uh, rental car agencies are really introducing um, uh, electric vehicles and you know plug-in uh, plug-in hybrids into their fleets, which is another very important way to expose uh, the market to uh, you know to these technologies and and the myriad 
um, applications in terms of kinds of vehicles that, that now have electric drive. You there should also, should not, you shouldn't make any assumptions about the passenger car market but due to what we're doing in, in uh, delivery vehicles. They're totally different markets. Right. Far less numbers of vehicles Right. Okay. Um, here, here, and then we'll go back there. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, mm -hmm. My question is for Mr. Davis, actually. So you touched upon um, the Department of Energy's uh, efforts on battery R&D, uh, and I think I think it's incredibly important to think, you know, improve battery technology has most potential for driving down costs and improving performance. So I'm wondering, um, how does the DOE work to transfer the technology to the private sector or to help commercialize the technology? The really great technology that you that you uh, Okay, good. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to show you we have a great track record of getting that technology into consumer products. So, for instance, it's DOE battery technology that's in the vast majority of all the current generation of hybrids uh, today, nickel metal hydride technology. Our technology is in the Toyota Prius, it's in the um, on the inside, it's essentially most hybrids on the road, and that was because of the work in nickel motor hydrides that uh, batteries that we did uh, back starting back in the early 90s. Um, and then uh, when you look at lithium ion, sort of a similar story. Uh, our technology is in the Chevy Volt. It's in the uh, battery technology in the, in the Chevy Volt. It's in the Mercedes S class. It's really showing up in, in uh, a number of vehicles. And one of the ways that we, we make sure that these battery technologies that we're developing are relevant to the market is that after we get um, very close to the market, but not quite there with a battery technology, uh, we start that final development phase involving the auto industry. And the auto industry is at the table with us when we work with battery manufacturers to do that final development work to make sure that these batteries meet the needs of the auto industry. Uh, so that, that's one way we ensure that the products and batteries we develop are relevant to the industry. Great. Uh, back here first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess principally this question is for Ed, but um, I was trying to, you were talking about 70% of the vehicles being met by electric power production. According to the DOE study. Okay, right. Uh, yeah, uh, I was just trying to figure out that um, maybe this isn't California so much, but uh, EPA rules and uh, for utilities um, curbing you know, coal, coal right. use and right. third year uh, production. Right. Uh, natural gas is coming online. How much do natural gas decisions, uh, pipeline expansion and, um, and, and power production turbines factor into the plugging argument uh, or an electric vehicle argument? Is there a certain threshold for natural gas advancement to get to, um, you know, the power production level that you need? Um, be, you know, because it's being, the, the grid is sort of being driven toward these right. clean so, power generation. So, so two points. The, the, the first point is that you know of all the the alternative fuels out there, ethanol, methanol, biodiesel, natural gas, hydrogen, electricity. There's only one that can actually claim that the dirtiest mile that you travel is the first day you drive the car. And the rest of it just gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, and that's electric. And the reason for that is because the grid is fundamentally going to get cleaner and cleaner and cleaner, which is what your point was. Um, you know, coal is kind of doing that. Uh, natural gas is kind of doing that. And renewables are doing that. You know, in California, 21%, I think it is, of all of the energy we provide to our customers comes from renewables today. So natural gas is going to grow. Uh, we're now the Saudi Arabia of natural gas here in the United States. So frankly, that will benefit transportation the more it connects to the grid. Um, you know, I think coal dropped something like 19% last year as feedstock, a percentage of feedstock in the US. So, uh, you know, I think that you, the, the transportation is going to benefit from the investments and the policies that are being made today, you know, here in the United States or on the grid. And can I just add to that? But the fact is, we don't have to, to wait for the grid to change for swapping out uh, gasoline electricity to be a better choice. Right. Um, with the 
current Washington, that study was done when the, when the grid was still more than 50% coal, which is not true today, um, that you still got, you know, in, in that grid scenario, more than 50% coal, you still got a third reduction in, in greenhouse gas, a third. Um, and, and as that said, every day, the car got cleaner. And then throw in the other benefit of, as opposed to controlling 250 million light duty tailpipes, you have a handful, a relative handful of stationary sources, which are the most regulated entities in the world, pretty much, um, as far as uh, their emissions. So there's also a, an ease of cleanup associated. So I think coal's gone from 52% to something like 36%, 33, 36, somewhere in that, that area, I think. And still problems. Um, I think that we are a little past our pointed hour, and maybe you can follow up uh, uh, afterwards. And uh, one one other extra little comment I wanted to add to what Ed had said is that just as I mentioned about our board member in Austin, with regard, they are now doing what's called a Bacon Street project, which is looking at the whole role of solar on homes, therefore providing the power for electric vehicles for, for that. So the, as, as Ed was saying, things are just getting cleaner and cleaner as we look at the decarbonization of the grid, and it just keeps changing. So, I've, I've got just a, a quick question. Sure. Madam Chair. <laughs> 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 Can you that card? You can ask questions. So what, how many people have driven an electric vehicle of any kind? Wow. Yeah, well done. Well done. <laughs> you know, and, and how many people were kind of, A, shocked, surprised that they were actually that good? How many people had fun with it? How many people had the EV smile? Look at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, right. it's a new term of art, the EV smile. All right, that's a great way to end the briefing. I want to thank our panel very, very much. I really, really appreciate your being here and talking about this.